We've been discussing radical matter and what we think it might mean and what it might become. I want to give you some ground rules, the ground things, in terms of certain philosophers that are important or theorists that are important for you to, to know speak to these problems and enable one to think without overthinking. Unfortunately, you're going to have to overthink in order to understand a lot of these, but we're all here in this and it's not at all clear. The first person you need to get a handle on, and I'm going to go through this in detail, and annoyingly at the moment, I'm going to cite uh, these Western white guys, but sometimes they have something to say, and this is one of them. Um, there's Immanuel Kant, K-A-N-T, and in particular, his thing on the Enlightenment, which I'll get into in a minute. The second is uh, G.W.F. Hegel, H-E-G-E-L, in particular, his notion of the dialectic. The third is Marx, his notion of the dialectic. Then we're going to jump, and we're going to do, um, I'm going to mention, uh, I'll mention Heidegger, identity and difference. Then I'm going to mention um, Deleuze, D-E-L-E-U-Z-E, U-Z-E, -E. and there's also Deleuze and Guattari, G-U-A-T-T-A-I-R, no, A-R-I. Anyway, you'll get all this in the list, so you don't have to actually memorize this. And you're welcome to, to record, by the way. Um, and the last uh, will be, just for the purposes of today and where we're going in this trajectory of Mathis, is Leotard. L-Y-O-T-A-R-D, Leotard, Jean-François Leotard. And in particular, his libidinal economy. Okay? Now, the reason I pointed all these out, the reason I mentioned these, is because this group of very different ways of thinking, very different types of theorists, have a sense of what happens when something circulates, when something moves around. And the question is, the moving around of something, is it an economy? Is it, a, um, is it an exchange? Is it giving a gift? What, what makes a circulation happen? Like, and part of the answer to revolution or not the answer to revolution, but the answer to get revolution going, is has always been linked with the question of material, or matter, or materialism. And you'll hear it like this. You'll hear material. Like one of the questions about class struggle, for example, is the way in which the owners of the means of production are situated in such a way as the people that produce the work don't own the work. And so the there's a discrepancy between uh, those that own and basically don't do very much and those that don't own and do everything. And this kind of discrepancy. And the way in which one could understand how revolution could take place so that that would change had to figure out what were the objective conditions around which change could happen. This is, this is very straightforward because there's only so many hours in the day, days in the week and weeks in the year. You don't live forever. And if there's exploitation and, and horribleness going on, you, you, can't, you can't kind of just guess. Well, you can guess, but it, you know, lots of lives are on the line, yours included, mine included. Now, Jean-Paul Sartre, in uh, Being Nothingness, had a very famous line, uh, which was, um, artists and militants often don't have time to read, and scholars often don't have time to do militant work. And it's a, it's a problem, actually. Um, now, I don't want to overestimate the importance of reading and being a scholar, because I just happen to be a scholar, but I want you to know that that can be quite a radical thing, and that sometimes you need to be able to sit down and read, and sit down and hear, and that will help the revolution. It is very important. And sometimes you gotta 
let go of those books and let go of those whatever and go out on the street. And you just need to know when those times are because they're not, no one's gonna tell you. That's the problem, that's another problem. So one of the ways to help with that problem is to understand how a logic works, how logics work. Why? Because it enables a form of prediction. It enables a form of what comes next so that you know what comes next. But of course, think about it in your lives and the objects you've shown today. You don't always know what comes next. You might not even know what comes now. Forget about what comes next, or even what went in the past. It's very difficult. And so the understanding of the what comes next, the thing that allows for this link to happen, means that somewhere in the process you have in your head, or communally given, logic some form of logic. Now that logic can be a gut, famous gut logic, or it can be a poetics of sorts, it can be, uh, we were talking about our lore earlier today, it can be a, a kind of uh, instrumental reason, A, B, C, next letter, D, right? And that is not because you've sat, sat and thought, what is the logic of the alphabet? You know that A, B, C means that you have a certain system in your head, in this case it's in English, and you know D is gonna be the next one. You didn't sit, or if I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the next number is eight. You didn't sit down and think to yourself, not, you know, not because, you didn't think to yourself, oh, we have to think about base 10. Okay, now we're in base 10. Okay, now what comes, if we, you're thinking of a clock, and we get up to 60, what's the next number? One. <laughs> As in very one. That's base sixty. In fact, base sixty doesn't have zero in it. That's interesting. Okay, so you're used to these systems. You can travel in between these systems. You ever, you travel in between military time, which is you know 1,300, 1,500, 2,400, and 12-hour time, right? Because it can say a.m. or p.m. On it. And you don't have a problem with that. that. That's going from 1 to 12, and then starts over again. That's going to be one base. You don't think to yourself, I'm in, I'm in base 12 now. Okay? But you are in base 12. Okay? Or, for example, if I say 1, 2, 3, 4, and usually the next thing is going to be 5, but instead of saying 5, I put tree. So I go 1, 2, 3, 4, tree. 6, 7, 8, 9. What come, what's the next thing? Tree, or even a double tree if you want to really be quite mad. Okay, so you can either put a tree or you can put a double tree. Let's say you don't want to put a double tree. Let's say you want to put a hamburger. Okay, so you have one, two, three, four, tree, six, seven, eight, nine, hamburger. Okay, now if you keep going, you can come up with a very weird dinner scenario with, with an outside patio, let's say. And that, and that you know what will come next. So if I w went from after, after hamburger, I said 11, 12, 13, 14. What would it be? So easy, this. Franchise. Franchise, that's right. <laughs> oh, I can't it. Could be, it, could, it could be a tree. It could be, it could, it could be a tree. Let's, let's call it a tree. Now, this is a very simple exercise, so simple that you didn't get it, um, that is called chains of equivalence. You need to understand that sentence. You need to remember it. You need to know that you've heard it. Chains of equivalence. Chains of equivalence means that I could say to you, as I was saying last night to my PhD students, um, I could say uh, skinhead, very overweight male with swastika stamped on the forehead, uh, wrapped in the uh, English flag, uh, drinking beer. What am I describing? A national front, a football hooligan, somebody that is, you know, got zero taste in drinking, right? But there's no reason, there's no logical reason why that should really mean football hooligan. We know it's a football hooligan because of the things that can get attached, and those are called equivalences, because you make them able to connect. And they just seem normal. Trump does this all the time. The first one to really do this quite well 
was Hitler. And it's not because I'm comparing Hitler to Trump, although I think there's some interesting comparisons. It is because Hitler was one of the first people that understood how to use media and how these equivalences get established and how the discourse operates. So we're gonna, so now we've got, we've got chains of equivalence, we've got the word discourse, and I also use, I also threw in base, like base 10 as a system. So you've already learned all of undergraduate philosophy. Okay, well done. Okay, also the question is, if a tree fell in the forest and no one heard it, did it fall? The answer is no. The answer is yes, no. <laughs> actually. I hate that question. You know, I used to like stand up in philosophy classes going, I hate this question. You know, like, you, who cares if the tree fell or moved or whatever? You know, nobody cares. It's, it has nothing to do with the tree falling, and that's not the kind of philosophy we're doing here. We're doing philosophy that will help us understand what Anne was pointing out and what we were all pointing out today, things that have, let's say, real consequences, real energies, real emotions. Well, how do you understand that? Answer, there are basically two, there are more than two, but there's at least two, and anyway, we're only concentrating on two, systems of how to do this. One system is called dialectical, and the other one is called discursive, or rhizomatic. Actually, they don't have a name for the other one. What I call it fractal philosophy or animaterialism, but even I'm not happy with those terms. Say the last A N A. Animaterialism. Radical matter. But anyway, what this is, what both of them do, dialectics on the one hand, radical matter on the other, is it, in, it, it attempts to get you to realize, or get all of us, not just you, but to get us to realize that anything you do say, understand, think about, fill in the blank, feel, pain, has a pluralism to it. Which is to say that it's always more than uh, a position. So anything that has a logic to it has at least two sides, which is gonna start with that. So did I lose you by saying that sentence? Are you okay with this sentence? Anytime you get lost, like, Put your head on the table, start flying, I don't know, do something, dance, let me know. So, so if I make a position, if I say something, how do you know it's true? I mean, apart from whether or not you care. How do you know it's true versus accurate, which is two different things? How do you know whether or not it is my opinion or it's got some validity to it bigger than me? How do you know this question? Next part of that question is how do you account for change without it being your opinion? So we're back to the revolution question. Like, it was my opinion back in the day that it was wrong to be homophobic. I didn't think to myself, wrong to be homophobic, must do something about it. I was being attacked. And so it didn't, you know, it, it was like being a feminist, you know. I didn't sit to think to myself, I want to be a feminist when I grow up. I didn't really have a big choice because what else could you be? It'd be absolutely insane not to be a feminist because otherwise everything would be taken away from you. You'd have to be, I don't know, shunted off to some stupid school or do something weird. So a lot of times being brave or fighting the good fight has absolutely nothing to do with wanting to be in the front line. Usually, in fact, it has absolutely nothing to do with it. It has to do with the fact that you couldn't run away. Like, you're in, look around. See, see us? We're a scary thought. Okay? Like, we, we are responsible for the world. It's upsetting. You know? Okay, now, when I say dialectic, so that you get a set, or, or plural, what you need to understand, we're not, we're not going to spend a lot of time on dialectics here. We're going to spend more time on physics and quantum physics and different forms of pluralism, because especially given what you're thinking about, I think it fits better and it works better. Although, you are more than welcome to, to get involved in dialectical thinking. Now, I just want to say that Judith Butler, or no, um, uh, which is what Anne was raising, is a dialectician. She, she comes from a Hegelian point of view. There's no tragedy in that, well, not a lot. 
but it's not my favorite thing, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, there's a lot of movements. The queer movement, for example, has gotten very involved in dialectical thinking and identity thinking. The women's movement got caught up in this. The gay movement, the trans movement, the civil rights movement, in fact, almost every movement has as its base a dialectical energy to it. And you need to know that. Either because you need to know that you are going to be repeating the same either errors or successes, or there might be a different way to think. So I'm going to do it very quickly. And anything you don't understand, ask Anya. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes? Um, I have three questions, comments to make. I don't know if you should make them after Not yet. Um, yeah, okay. make it after I just get this little bit out, OK? Mm -hmm. Picture an acorn, which is a seed. You know, and when an acorn unfolds, when, when you put an acorn in the ground and you water it and you give it whatever, it turns out to become what? An oak tree. Yes, excellent. Yes, well done. See, <laughs> first philosopher. OK, we know that if we watered it properly, put it in the right soil, and we didn't stick it in orange juice or something, we actually put it in the right way, it would grow up all things considered to become an oak tree, right? That's the goal of the, of the seed of, that seed, of that particular seed. It is not gonna grow up to become an ant. It's not gonna grow up to become an octopus. It's not gonna grow up to become a car. It's gonna grow up to become an oak tree. That's what it's gonna do. And anything you do in order to make that happen has that in mind. So anything that you're gonna do to that bloody seed if you want it to grow properly, you're going to water it, you're going to talk to it, you're going to do whatever you need to do to make it go into a tree. But what happens if the seed wants to become a glass of orange juice? What if the seed doesn't want to become an oak tree? Then what happens? Put that in the back of your mind. So the seed is unfolding, and I'm going to do unfolding like a spiral. The seed unfolds, unfolds, you are getting some more time. And it becomes a tree. And the tree gives meaning to the seed. So the tree, which is the end point, or let's say even the purpose of the seed, the tree gives the directions on how that seed is going to grow. We know that if we give it water and not uh, oil, it's going to grow into a tree. It's going to grow into a nice, wonderful, lovely tree. We don't necessarily know the shape, but that's what the, the, it can decide that itself. So it has a very limited sense of choice, the seed. It can decide to grow or not grow. It can do like this or something, but it will still become an oak tree. It will become a Maserati car. So you have this tree, and it gives meaning to the seed. And that is called telos. That's your first thing you need to get a sense of. And telos is an unfolding. You have a start, and the start is, in this case, the seed, which comes to be the tree. And the process that it takes is the talos. So a talos means that the end goal gives meaning to the start. So in fact, it's the end goal that you're actually starting with. Should we bring them in and put them on the table? <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Uh, now the Talos like T A L. -O -S. No, sorry, T E L O S. Talos, T E L O S, or teleology, which means logic of. I'm going to give you a little logic of the talos. Now it's not circular reasoning; it's unfolding reasoning, and we have it all the time. A baby is born; is born male. It's going to get doctor. So and so has been born, you know, or whatever. I mean, that's my joke. Uh, if it's born female, it's often seen to be it's going to grow up to be a wife. If it's a male, it's going to grow up to be a husband. And then what happens if it doesn't do that? Okay, tragedy, gnashing of teeth, you know, disownership. Lots of things go wrong when that little creature decides to go some other path. So the telos, which is in every society, 
speaks to this problem about change because you're thinking you're a baby and then you grow up. And when you were a baby, I mean, everyone in this room has been a baby, once at least. And we know that as a baby, you look different than you do now. So you've changed. But it's not like you've jumped out of your skin and changed. You have grown or unfolded or genetically done something. And that's now you're the you now of the, of the baby that was growing. And so it's very easy, it's, it's, it, or it's very um, comfortable, maybe that's a better way of saying, to understand telos because we, we, we experience it. Baby, adult, gonna die, have death, inform your life. Like, like we were talking, a lot of us have had a lot of death in our world, and so the death informs the life. It, it, is, it is a feature of no, sort of usual way of thinking, and it's very important that you understand that it operates, and it's very powerful. It's a very powerful thing, Taylor. Now, the, Back, way back when, there was a person named Her <coughs> Heraclitus, H-E-R-A, Clitus, C-L-I-T-I-S, or U-S, depending on how you Heraclitus. Um, and Heraclitus was technically considered the inventor of the dialectic. And what Heraclitus did is he put his toe in the water, and he realized that the toe was wet, but the current wasn't the same thing that was making his toe wet. So this might sound crazy, and from this developed the dialectic, but he puts his toe in the water, and he realizes that his to to, in order for his toe to be completely wet, there had to be something that enables a fuller relationship to this wet. And he realizes that the opposite of wet is not wet. So <laughs> not dry, it's not wet. So the opposite of wet is not wet. So when the water's flowing down, he's got his toe here, it's not going wet, not wet, wet. Not. That's not how it works, right? Right? You know that, right? You know that if you're thinking about water, it's not going wet, not wet, wet, not wet, wet, not wet. It's because that's just a crazy way of thinking. Instead, what it's doing is, let's say on this side of the wet, it's wet. And on this side of the wet, it's not wet because this is not the side of the wet. This is the not wet, this is the wet. Not wet, wet, not wet. Wet. What's the opposite of dry? Not dry. What's the opposite of old? Not old. What's the opposite of female? Not female. See how easy this is? Okay. Yes. And what happens with not not wet? Hold on. Okay. okay. We're almost there. Okay. So, however, that's really not going to tell you a whole lot, not even the not not wet, the day to day negation. What we're going to do here, just breathe. <laughs> Very hard. We're going to give him, where's your drops? <laughs> um, okay. We have wet, not wet, or to put it in philosophy terms, thesis, antithesis. The thesis is the is, I-S, the, the here, and the now. So it's the is. Present. It's the here, right here, and is right now. But of course, you can't really understand this, says Hegel. You can't really understand the is, because the minute you're in the is, it's gone somewhere else. So you're always approaching the is. You're always trying to grasp it. So, not to get too far into this, but the is and the not is, or the, the thesis and the antithesis, have to do something to make sense, literally to, to make it alive, to make it so that it's you know, not going wet, not wet, wet, not wet. It's got to do something that gives it a fullness. 
Now this fullness is called universal. We are in this group doing transversal or multiversal. Spoiler alert, okay? So just stay with me on this. This is called universal because the question that was asked in metaphysics for 2,000 years or more was how do you account for change without adding something to the system or can God come in and make something change? How do you, how do you make change happen? The way you make change happen, I don't know how to change that door, shut that door, it's so annoying. Is, can that door shut? It doesn't seem to want to move, I tried. Well done. Oh no. Yay. Yay, I obviously didn't try very hard. Okay. <laughs> Again, think about the earring. <laughs> and getting the wrong pierce, okay? So that doesn't surprise me that I wasn't able to move that thing. Okay, now, so you have thesis, not thesis. So something has to happen, says Hegel, that makes the whole thing deal with change without stepping outside itself. And the way the, that happens, and just take note, is that one side cannibalizes the other. It's quite violent, really. He doesn't call it cannibalizing, by the way. He calls it sublation. It sublates. And sublate is a fantastic word. I've always loved that word. It's a great Scrabble word. Um, it's a great word for those of you that like espresso coffee. Does anybody make espresso coffee with a proper espresso machine? Not one of these espresso things, but an actual espresso machine. Does anybody use it? As, uh, you know, you put water in the bottom, and it grinds, and then you and then you put the water, and you heat it up, and the... the uh, yeah, yeah, I used to do it in the morning. Okay. Yeah, in the and then what happened? And the coffee basically come out. No, no, why are you not doing it now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see, you don't have it. Oh, okay, okay. Which one? Oh, sublate. Yeah, sublate. S-U-B-L-A-T-E, or I-O-N. Sublation. Sublate, sublate, and that is a form, an analytic form of cannibalization, because one of these sides swallows up the other, just like in espresso. The water gets into those beans, and you don't say when the coffee sits there up there, you don't go, oh, I'm now having water, hot water, boiled water, and coffee beans. You're saying I have this thing called coffee, right? You don't call it water, you don't do this whole long explanation water, fire, coffee, beans. You have this thing called espresso. And espresso gives meaning to the whole morning of your life. You know, <laughs> espresso gives meaning to that whole process. Okay, So the coffee comes back around and gives it a ground. Another important word, ground, which we are also going to get rid of. <laughs> We're just going to get rid of a lot of stuff today before we go on. So the ground gives meaning to these two sides. So the ground, meaning the concept, or in this case coffee, comes back around and gives meaning to your sleepy state of putting the water and the grinds together, boiling it. One of it gets to it, becomes coffee, becomes, and that becomes the ground. Now, I'll do it in Marxist terms, so you've heard it in Marxist terms, because it's a little bit more powerful than, well, I mean, not that coffee isn't powerful, but thesis is going to be the bourgeoisie. The not thesis is going to be the proletariat. Taken together, one gets cannibalized by the other. No surprises there, who gets cannibalized? <laughs> okay, you know. That creates the capitalist mode of production which comes back around and gives ground, gives meaning to those two sides. Now, the Hegelian move is that, and then if you believe this one, I've got some snake oil, or other kinds of oil, uh, that you might like, but he, Hegel makes the argument that the slave has more power than the master, 
because the master has to depend on the slave in order to be a master. It's like, it's like oh, that's great. You know, I love it. <laughs> it's like, okay, okay. Spot the flaw with that in case you happen to be a slave. Okay. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you for giving me the possibility of being your slave, you know, and, and, and keeping you as a master. It's fabulous. Anyway, um, but there's the point is that he's making is that one side keeps the other side afloat. And usually the side that gets cannibalized is the one that keeps the other one afloat. And it's kind of, an, okay, I realize that this is a little bit of a more radical way to read uh, the phenomenology of spirit. Uh, lordship and mas uh, master and slave dialectic in phenomenology of spirit. Yes? No, I'm in my eye. Oh, okay, right. sorry. <laughs> Same, very fair. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, like a frog eating a fly. <laughs> yes? <laughs> Do you want? Okay, now, we're just going to a little bit more because we're almost done with this part. So, Marx argues that in order for revolution to happen, one side has to drop out of this picture. Obviously, the bourgeoisie are not going to drop out of the picture because they have everything to win. They, 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 they have too much to lose. But the workers have only the dialectic to lose. They only have their chains to lose. They only have this weird this, this thing. Now, this is very important to understand because a lot of revolutions are based on this fact, or this way of understanding fact, way of understanding reality. And anyone who's a modern, already understands reality in this way, minimally, minimally. Now, let's just go over it again so we're clear, because a lot of times people think that this side might be male and this side might be female. Taken together creates patriarchy, comes back around and forms the ground. It has the same uh, cachet. It, it feels like it makes sense, but unfortunately it's not the whole picture. And so you can make it on anything, uh, homophobia, racism, whatever. Because the problem has been that even when the revolutions get started, for some reason, it's like plastic with a memory, it doesn't get changed. How come? What is it that's not working? Like when I told you about the, uh, the when, when we had our first uh, gay pride march in Toronto, I think it was 1982, which is already, that's not that long ago, really. Um, and people were wearing bags on their heads. One of the things that was happening with the Clint group was that there's a number of women that believed in um, sorcery, and there still is. I mean, no, <coughs> very specific kind of um, feminist witchcraft, and wanted to have the Gay Pride Day on a very specific date when the stars would align and the witches and the warlocks could come out and patriarchy would fall on a very particular date. And do you know we spent about three months arguing about this date, about whether or not, and I, and I of course did not believe in the patriarchy falling because, because of the spells and the way the planets would align. And I kept saying, well, if that were true, why isn't it already happening? I was like losing my mind on this. Um, but we did pick the date because that was the best chance of patriarchy falling, given all the alignments. So you can see how if you have a certain kind of method, it could lead to an incorrect analysis, but maybe not. Maybe it could lead to the correct one. But then why, how do you know? And so on and so forth. So I tell you this because the dialectic is absolutely, profoundly part of your everyday reality, just like Talos is. And in fact, the more sophisticated form of the dialectic is a Telos, because what's happening here is all that there is plus all that there's not, taken together, synthesized, makes reality, and reality comes back around and grounds the picture, the whole thing. And this thing called back around is a weird thing. It has other names. Becoming. Transcendence. Imminence. Double negation. Double negation. Well, we're not going to go there yet. I'm just going to mention it, just so because I want to clarify that because it's very complex. Because when you think of the synthesis, it comes back and around and forms the ground, and the ground is back around. So the synthesis could be the tree, let's say, that comes back around and gives meaning, goal, 
process to the start, that's why it's the ground, to the seed. And in, in a fuller way of understanding it is that there's seed, not seed, taken together, creates this thing, comes back around and forms the ground. But the back around bit is the complicated thing. Now for Hegel, his argument was the ground is knowledge. The ground is a concept. It's not just any old concept. It's not uh, a particular concept. It's the concept. It's knowledge. It's absolute knowledge. And absolute knowledge grounds the movement. By the movement, I mean this thing like that that then sets up the, the, the process, or in fact, an actual movement like jihad or democracy. How many people, I can tell you about gay liberation and feminism, take a word, it's not just any word, it's not just hanging in there going, oh, that word. It's, it drives the movement. So these are real, material, painful experiences that you need to get a sense of how this works. And Marx, what he does, he says, you know, Hegel's right about the way the dialectic works. But Hegel's wrong about the way in which he understands the concept being the ground. So what Marx does, are you ready for this? Yeah? No? Do you need me to go over this again? I think you should um, go over again about the relation between uh, physicism, physicists, and the um, rounding world of knowledge. Okay, okay. See this table? This table has a surface. If I told you to cut off the surface, take a little knife and cut it off, where would it go? You throw the surface behind me, let's say, and then what's this thing called? Surface. Take another knife, peel it off again, throw it over my shoulder. What happens? Surface. I could keep cutting this table till there was like just a splinter left, it's still that would be the surface. What happens to the thing I just threw over there? Nothing. Once it leaves the structure, nothing. If you are dealing with dialectics. You can't leave this structure, actually. That's how good Hegel was. He realized that you could have change and never leave the structure. You didn't need God coming in. You needed to have a ground. Now, have you ever heard the expression, I feel grounded, or I feel ungrounded? or you know, I don't feel like myself, that kind of thing. The ground is a very specific feeling. It's a very specific way of being. In fact, one could go farther and say it is being, but that's another story. The gra to feel grounded means that somehow all of this fits together. So if you're feeling like you've got your foot and you're floating off somewhere, you know, because you're an immigrant and you, you know, like you were doing with your picture and stuff, you're like, you know, where am I? Here's that, where's that bloody phone so I can just see who I am every five seconds. If you're like floating away, then you're not quite as grounded as you could be. Gra ground is very important. The problem with ground, the great, the great news about ground is it makes you feel, it not just makes you feel better, it, it, it is solid. So, you know, if I say to you, oh, sorry about this, spoiler alert, there's no ground, you know, um, then there's only a fire drill. Is this an actual fire? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. But it might be. What? I said it might be because it's touching it. That's right. The ground gives you a solidity. So grounded. So much better. No ground. Ooh, falling. Now, Harold, uh, Hito Sterl, Harold is speaking. Hito Sterl has a book, uh, in fact, she has a film out called Falling. Sadly, it's completely wrong, but all right. But, it, but, it, but she, because she, what she does with this is she says, you know, all these postmodernists are saying there's no such thing as a ground. And they say there's no such thing as green, so we're just falling, we're just falling, we're just falling, there's no ground, there's no ground. Okay, wrong. There is no ground, but you're not falling anymore. But that's just a whole other thing. That's where we're going to end up on at the end of this. But right now, just for right now, just to be as clear as we can be, as clear as mud, 
So you have the synthesis, so you have all that there is, and all that there is can stretch in any direction. It can go any direction. Just think all that there is. Think about how far is all that there is. And can you get outside of all that there is? Like, you think in your head how you're stretching out all that there is, all that there is, all that there is. And maybe you run out of breath, but could you just step over the all that there is? Can you get outside of the all that there is? And once you get grasp that, you're a modern. Because if you can't get outside of all that there is, you know you can't get outside the universe. You can't get outside the solar system. There is no outside the solar system. Now that's creepy. It's like, you know, the, the, the hands drawing themselves. There's, there's nothing outside. So think about it again. And all the way, all the way, all the way, all the way outside into infinite. And then on the other hand, on the other side, or the other, the inverse of the infinite is the not infinite, which is also having the same thing in all directions. And in all directions, so I'm just doing it as a plane, but think of all directions. And then you just poof, just blow up, because that's just too much mental gymnastics. Okay, so now, let's just go back to this. So just picture this stretching out for as long as it can be, or, if I go like that, it's not like this side is running to catch up with this side. They go at the same time. There's, there's, they are they're stuck together. So the not side isn't going, hmm, maybe I'll go with the side or maybe I won't. Oh, no, I'll go. No, it just goes. So first step of thinking plurally is to realize, A, that it's going off in all directions, and at the same time, the not side of it is also going off in all directions, and taken together, it creates a pluralism. Not pluracy, which is a bonus, but pluralism. Plurality, a multiple. And that multiple allows one to change things. Because if there, think of it like this, think of it as though there's air involved. That's what I was telling the PhD student just. Think of it as air being in there. Air allows you, you know, you're like Houdini trying to get out of your handcuffs that you've decided to jump into a river and you've sunk down the bottom, and you need to find the air pocket. You need to find the air pocket. That the air pocket exists in everything. There's always the not side to the something. But to make that more real, or what Hegel will say is concrete, that's the word he uses, like concrete, in order to make it something other than an abstraction, which is to say this thing that you can't even put in your head going in all directions, you have to be able to synthesize it. You have to be able to sublate or cannibalize, you have to sublate the one side into the other. And you do that, but this thing sits on top. Okay, I've sublated, I've sublated. Yay. But that's the surface. So the surface is the sublation excess. It's the thing that comes up, the coffee, that then comes back around and gives meaning, in this case table, makes sense because we see how it is got its surface. It gives meaning to this, so it gives it, it grounds it. It makes it understandable. This, and this is the question I think Pablo was uh, making me, or asking me to respond to, is this bit coming back around, it doesn't, I mean, I'm putting it this way to give you a sense of ground because we are humans and we are, to, to think that ground is here is gonna be difficult unless you're Australian and you already know that the ground is up here, you know, or like they kind of, yeah. But I'm only doing it that way because we understand ground is here and this is sky, let's say. But in fact, it could be like that, or like that, or like that. It could be, it could be like any of that, right? But just, we'll just keep it like that. So the transcendent moves. Somehow this goes to here. Now the moving is like tree rings. You know, you ever cut a tree down and you see the rings of a tree? You know how those rings are? If you pulled out a ring, 
You really can't do that, can you? You can't really pull out the ring of a tray. I mean, I mean, I suppose you could on some news, or but it, it doesn't make any sense. So it's not that the it's not that this is going anywhere. It's not that the tree, for example, has uh, is marking all of its lives, and you can see like you know the millions of years. It's that the energy that's in this is the movement. So it's not like this is going. Got the thing. We can tell with the coffee, we know that there is movement. There's literally the coffee, the, the water, the blah, 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 goes back around, makes sense of your day. But, quote, in reality, a concept doesn't go anywhere, just like the left, the backside and front side don't, don't run up to catch up with each other. They don't go anywhere, but they move. They move, they have movement, they vibrate, they have a they have an energy. Let's just call it like they have an intensity. So you can make colors out of it. You can make tones out of it. It's not the solid block. And that's the first step of understanding how to think plurally so that when you've got these both sides that are going on, then the synthesis comes back around, forms the ground. The ground then gives meaning to both sides. What Mark, can I go on? Is that making sense now? Okay, so what Marx does, he says, well, this is all very interesting. But it's not right because it's not wrong, but it's not completely right. Because what Marx wants to say is it's not the concept that grounds the truth, it's the movement, which he calls this thing here, that was calling transcendence or becoming. What he names it as is history or the political. It's this bit. These are the different names he's giving it. So we have it like that, it's Hegel. I mean, really what Marx says is that he puts Hegel on his head. But that's just too much gymnastics, so I'm just getting you to think about it, Hegel on the side, okay, as opposed to the head. But if it helps you to put Hegel on the head, anyway, what, whatever. Have I lost you yet? Okay, keep going. Yeah, it doesn't go anywhere. So, how to explain this? Um, okay, I'm gonna do it a completely way I've never explained it before, so I don't know it's gonna work. Okay, okay. Here's your phone, and in your phone, you have uh, like 10,000 songs, or 10,000 files, let's say. Now, I've used this example before, but not to explain your point. Um, if I broke my phone open, I wouldn't have 10,000 files fall out, right? I would have a very sad me and a broken phone. Because somehow we've got these files going in here, and they have actual manifestations. They, they don't re if you broke this open, you wouldn't really find the file called you know, oil or something. But you know that if you did look on it, you, you would find it. And so it has some kind of synapse, something that goes on. And that something that goes on, that something other, let's call it, that goes on, that, that else thing, elsewhere thing, that's this movement. So you're not going anywhere, you're not really finding anything, you're not really able to hold it, but it exists. And it's what creates the movement. And in a certain sense, you want to say that it is the movement. So the movement is this kind of thing. Yeah. There was a thing is I forgot the name, but in Oxford, um, I think during the sixties and seventies, there was a very important commentator on Hegel. More, 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 more. Uh, I can't. There's, that's a, there's a lot of people from, from Cambridge. I think he was in Oxford. Okay. Um, I think he was. And he, I had a sort of German ish, German sound there in Spanish. Okay, this is really narrowing it down. Um, um, <laughs> like, like more, but I can't. I can't <laughs> okay, that's that. good. The accent was good. Uh, thank you. I'm good at it. Um, <laughs> and the thing is, he explains very well the arise of, of movement from dialectics. Let's not go there yet. I'm let's, sorry? let's not go to the rise of yet. Okay. Mm. Not yet. No, but well, anyway. We will be but, going there. I was going to suggest that you have to bring the text and... Yeah, perfect. Put it online. Because it's 
Yeah. Send it around on the group. We'll make it a separate this group. Be such a fine group. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, that's good. The right now is be good. There's, uh, we haven't gotten the rise on this next week. Um, but we are at the hour, which is annoying. Um, and so what I would like to do is to just quickly summarize where we are at this very millisecond. Next week, we're going to look at exactly what we're talking about now, but we're going to frame it in terms of appetites. So we'll get more into this cannibalizing thing. We'll get more into um, the way in which um, this kind of intensity operates. And I want you to look at a couple of things. I mean, you can absolutely look at a dialectical reading of anything to help you here. The, the takeaway from today is just that you get a sense of how meaning is plural or a fact has this yes side, not yes side. Synthesis, movement, takes the whole picture, it's the whole picture. Just, just keep saying that over and over again as a mantra. Oh, diction, universal, universal, creates a totality, creates a oneness, something like that. Just keep saying that over and over again. Next week, I would like you to look at, apart from the uh, article that Bob was going to suggest, um, Deleuze, I'll send it around so you have it, but um, Deleuze and Guattari wrote this uh, book called Thousand Plateaus, and in it is a section called The Rhizome, and I want you to, first of all, look at the rhizome. I want you to also look at uh, the introduction to libidinal economy by Jean-Francois Lyotard, where he's talking about cutting open uh, a body. You'll see. Um, Are you sending us the reference? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just telling you so you, it's in your head. Um, and we could throw in take it yeah. No. Um, Okay, those two things. Okay, so sorry. There, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. <laughs> okay, we'll just do rhizome, and we'll do the introduction to the Atari. The libidinal economy. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Do you know it? I've read it. I've well, I have read it, but my memory is really shit. I only remember the bit about Marx and the school girl. Yeah. So annoying. That's just what I mean, you know, it's so irritating these people, you know. You know, they look around, they, they come up, they're so intelligent and they come up with this stupid <laughs> and you just think, seriously, that's what you come up with your theory? Anyway, we'll help them along. Um, we will organize them so they can think a little bit better. Uh, but the thing is the, the thing I want you to concentrate is the Leotard bit is actually to understand this intensity question. What is an intensity? Just really understand intensity. So you'll see in the first chapter, it's like opening up the body, cutting it open, looking at the genitals and whatever, it gets very graphic. Then once you get through that shock horror, then look at the thing called tensor, tensor band. Just, just to get a sense of how something has an energy, an intensity, a cohesion, something like that. So those two things, rhizome and uh, libidinal economy, the section of opening the body up, and then the tensor band. And I'll send it to you so you, you have it. Yes. Yes. You mean right now? No, not right now. We'll do it um, next week. I'm thrilled to meet you guys. I think we're, Anya and I were both saying, and, and Anne, we were saying, all three of us were saying at the break, it is wonderful. You guys are just fabulous. It happens. <laughs> um, the other thing is, is that you're going to be assessed. I don't know what that means. You don't get marks, as far as I know. Um, but this is a new thing, so you're all guinea pigs. Uh, this is the first time we've ever tried it. I have no idea why, but Michael Terrico just sent me a note while I was in the thing saying how assessment works, and I haven't looked at it that much, but apparently you're supposed to just do something, and I'm not sure what that is that you're doing, but it, whatever it is, I'll tell you next week when I get a clarity on it. Uh, and it, it will all happen on the 14th, your assessment. It's okay, so I don't know if that means bring an object again. You can do the same object, or you're going to assess it something. You know, I'm not sure what assessment's going to mean. We'll play it by ear. Don't nervous, don't have over nervous breakdowns about these. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Yeah. And I'll send around. Is it all right if I send around your? Um,